Hey everyone, it's John and today what I want to do is continue on the CCMP based switched video series. So in today's video, what I want to do is discuss RootGuard. Now this video is going to have kind of three main points. The first one is just a kind of general overview of RootGuard, um, what it is, why you would configure it and how to configure it. The second kind of point I want to make is the more interesting point I think because this is a more, this is a rare event when I myself actually happen to disagree with a Cisco best practice when it comes to design. So um, I'd like you to listen to my point, I'll see if you think I'm right. If you don't, then please leave a comment, tell me why you think Cisco have got it right, and if you make a good case, I'll revise my position and change my tune. So <laughs> uh, that's that one. And the last point is where I kind of want to highlight where I do think RootGuard actually is effective because even though I can see why it's why it's designed the way it is, I think it's a, it can be quite poor in its execution of what it's trying to do. So, but like I say, there actually are some good use cases for it and I want to highlight that towards the end. So what I'll do is start this video off by just describing the basic topology. So, we've got three switches here and on the left here we've got what's going to be our root bridge, which means that this will be a root port and this will be a root port. Now this is fine. Now what does RootGuard um, seek to achieve? Well its name is pretty descriptive of its function, that is that it's supposed to guard the root. Now what does that actually mean? So let's just say, for example, somebody either deliberately or inadvertently changes the topology by doing this. They grab switch 4, okay, and they plug it in to the topology. Now switch 4, let's say, has got a lower priority than the current root bridge. What happens therefore is that switch 4 now becomes the root bridge and in this case this would no longer be the root port. This would be a root port, this would be a root port, this would be a root port and this link here one end of it would be in blocking, one would be designated but effectively this link can't, trans this link can't um, transmit data frames. So in the, say, the example, this could be your main distro switch and your secondary one. You'd have HSRP active and standby here and whatnot, and um, you've got a nice high-speed link between these two, and it's basically blocked because the traffic is pointing towards, it's basically created a spanning tree pointing towards this little switch down here. Now what RootGuard does, it basically says that well, first off, where are you supposed to configure RootGuard? You configure it on designated ports, which should never be root ports. So let's look at the same example again. Switch 4 is down here, and this interface of Switch 3, which is going to connect to Switch 4, that's going to be a designated port, but we identify that, that this should never ever be a root port, because the root bridge should never be down here. The root bridge is up here, or worst case scenario, up here. We don't want it to be down here, so we'll basically configure root guard on this interface so that what happens if switch 4 sends a superior BPDU in on this interface, this interface here is going to go into a state called root inconsistent. Now what root inconsistent means, it kind of acts like error disabled, except that it's self-healing. It will basically auto-recover once this switch stops sending those superior BPDUs, so when it stops sending those superior BPDUs, this switch will actually open up again. Switch four, uh, switch four rather, won't be isolated anymore, and switch uh, one will still be the root bridge. So that's the kind of general theory around it, and you can see that what it seeks to achieve is pretty good. It seeks to achieve kind of network stability, so we don't have these random variations and unexpected topology changes whereby some switch down the kind of hierarchy becomes this, the kind of centre of your layer 2 topology. So that's pretty much um, the just, the, the kind of basic overview of it. Now, like I said, there was something what I said there about placement. There's two points to make. The actual theory about the placement, put it on a designated port, which should never be a root port, that bit's fine. The kind of part where I disagree with Cisco is what kind of switches do they do this on? Now, let's look at this. As you can see here, this would be our, um, let me just change the color of that. 
this switch here is going to be the root bridge, okay? Now, as you can see, Cisco is saying put the root guard on these interfaces down here, okay? And the same here, across here. Basically, on these designated ports, pointing towards switches, which should never be root, which should never be root ports, basically, because root ports should never be down here, okay? Now, they haven't configured it on this link between these two, because perhaps this second switch, the secondary backup, might eventually become the root bridge, so you don't want to put it there. Another point to consider is they've actually configured loop guard between these two, and loop guard and root guard are mutually exclusive. You can't configure the two of them on the same link, okay? You just, you can't have that done. So, the point to remember here is that what they're saying is, the root bridge here, STP root, as said here, put root guard on its designated ports, on the distribution switch, on the root guard, or on the root bridge, sorry. And that's where I want to take issue. So first off, before I do that, let me just show you the basic operation of root guard. So what I'm going to do is do a conf t spanning tree vlan1 root primary. So this is the root bridge. And we're going to go on to switch 2 and just do a basic show span. And we'll see that it's gigabit 01 as the root port, which is pointing towards the root bridge, which makes perfect sense. And switch 3 is also, it's going to have its gigabit 00 pointing towards, as the root bridge pointing towards, the root port, sorry, pointing towards the root bridge. <laughs> um, and that's it there, gigabit 00, root, this one here. All good. So let's follow through on this um, this kind of implementation. What we're going to do is on, like I say, designated ports. In the case of the root bridge, all ports are designated. And what we're going to do is configure root guard on both of these interfaces. So gig 001, and we'll do spanning tree guard root. All fine. And let's go to switch two. Gigabit 02 is a designated port, but it should not be a root port. We should only see um, superior BBDs come on, on this link to the root bridge, not here, not some inferior switch down the chain. So let's go on to gig 02, and basically what we're saying here is if we see a superior BBD on this link, shut it down, we don't want it to kind of bleed into the topology. And that's that. So like I say, there is nothing wrong here right now. Everything is just working fine because there is no, um, there's no superior BPDU. So let's go and configure this. And we'll do spanning tree VLAN 1 and make it priority 0 and we'll see what happens. Oh, you can type John. <laughs> okay, so what's happened is we've effectively superseded the priority of the root bridge. We'll give it a priority of 0. We've sent out a superior BPD on this port. So that means that this is going to go into root inconsistent. And same again up here, this port has been configured with root guard, so this is going to go into root inconsistent, so let's see the same thing. Show span. See that? Root inconsistent, and this port is now blocked. So what have we done here effectively? We've blocked off the lower half of the network here, and we've kept this as the root. So that seems fine, okay, we're still the root bridge, and that's fine, but like I say, this link is now down. So, I suppose We've achieved our goal, but like I say, if it's if all these downstream links um, are configured, what potential issues could arise? Now that's why I'm going to pause the video and kind of highlight a, a scenario, a very, very plausible scenario, I think, where this can go wrong. So just hold um, the video a wee second and I'll be back in one minute. Okay, so as you can see, there's been a slight change in the topology. We've got our basic, our classic rather, our classic hierarchical three-tier model. And at the top, we've got the core layer. Down below, we've got the distribution layer, and at the very bottom, we've got the access layer. Now, these red links here, they're all layer 3 links, which denotes that they're point-to-point, -point, no switch ported, with IP addresses on the physical interfaces, and in between it all, would have a routing protocol running like OSPF or ISIS or EIGRP or something, okay? Now, down at the distribution layer, we're going to have switch 3 as a root bridge, switch 4 as the secondary bridge, root bridge, the backup one. Similarly, uh, consistent with good practices, we're going to have switch 3 aligned 
our root bridge align with our HSRP active router. So switch 3 is going to be the HSRP active, switch 4 is going to be the HSRP standby. And we've got layer 2 between these two. We're going to assume that VLANs are spanning here, so we're going to have layer 2 here. And layer 2 all the way down to the access layer. And the access layer is just going to have just generic uh, VLAN configurations. And we'll have our workstations connecting in, and they can have access to the network via that. So let's just have a look again at this graphic to refresh what we were saying with Cisco. So like I say, Cisco pretty much say that in the case of our STP route, which is this one here, what they want to do is have root guard configured on these links facing down towards the access layer to pretty much say that if this switch announces that it's the root bridge and it sends a BPDU, it's going to get blocked. Same again, if this switch sends a superior BPDU or a switch attached to this one, it can't bleed into the network and change this, okay? So that's the basic theory behind it. What I will say as well, that they've actually not configured these, this link rather, between uh, both distros as having root guard on it. That might be because they decided that, you know, this could be a potential backup root bridge in the case that if it did and it sent a superior BPDU, we wouldn't want to block that link. The same again is that they've actually got loop guard configured here and loop guard and root guard are mutually exclusive. You can't configure them both on the same uh, interfaces. So the main point to take away here is that root guard is being configured on the root bridge facing towards the uh, access layer and again same here, root guard down here. So that's what we're going to do, we're going to emulate that right here on our network and see what problems might arise with this. So let's go and configure it. Um, so if we go in and do enable conf t int gig 0 3, we're on switch 3 right now, and we do spanning tree guard root int gig 1 0, spanning tree guard root int gig 1 1, spanning tree guard root, that's that done. Let's switch over to switch 4. Same again, we're going to do int gig 1 0, spanning tree guard root int gig 1 1, spanning tree guard root and gig zero three span and tree up oh, guard root okay so now we've configured it just as just as we've seen in that graphic now what might go wrong here can you think just looking at this what happens if this link just happens to fail what do you think the implementation the implications might be of that well let's just test it out and gig zero one up oh. let's see what the implications are just give it a minute, we'll shut that down, and down it goes. So if you just hold back a few seconds, we'll see something happen. There'll be a change in the topology directly as a consequence of a root guard configuration. And this is why I don't think it's I don't think it's that good a design. So let's have a look and see what's happened now. All our links blocked every one is root inconsistent because of that one failed link we've effectively what's happened is this link has just happened to fail and because of that the impact is that switch 3 to get its BPDUs to switch 4 is reflecting them effectively through the access layer down here and down here and down here and down here so what does that mean well just remember we've got root guard configured on here here and here and root guard is saying if i receive a kind of root bridge bpdu so to speak on any of these links we're going to go to root and consistent and shut them down so when these have been reflected this link shutting down this link shutting down this link shutting down and this link's broken so effectively this HSRP standby, the secondary root bridge is basically non-existent to the access layer now, it's completely wiped out. Now you might think, well what's the big deal, we could still correct that and like I say at least it's not the the active router, oh just change it, at least it's not the active router. Well that might be a point, you might say okay well 
this one's still up, and this is our active, so if we've got a workstation here, and we try to route out to, let's say, Google, 8.8.8.8, .8 we send the traffic up here, and it goes across to the active, and it goes out, and it goes out, and comes back, and back in, and everyone's A-OK. -okay. Well, that's the best case scenario, that does look quite nice, but here's the problem, okay? See this uh, layer 3 network we've got here? There's a really good thing you get with layer 3, and it's called ECMP, Equal Cost Multipath, okay? And it is a great thing, really very, very efficient. But what it does, it means that we're going to load balance the traffic. So what might happen is whilst this is the active router, i oh, keep hitting that pen, this is the active router and it goes out here and it goes out here and out to Google. When the traffic comes back, there is nothing to say that it won't equal cost multipath across this link here. Rather than go down here, it might go across here. Or some of the traffic, some of the packets might go here and some of the packets might go across here, which means that a large proportion of your traffic is going to transit here to a switch. When this link is broken, this is root guard, inconsistent, 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 and none of the traffic can get out now. So all your return traffic is effectively black holed as a direct result of root guard being configured at the distribution layer. And this is why I don't think this is particularly a great design. So it's pretty much a, you're weighing this up, cost versus a risk, reward risk type thing. Is it worth it? Well, I don't think so, because I think if you're going to protect your root, your root bridge, I think a better idea would be to have um, well, for a start, configure you. If you really want this root bridge to stay as the root bridge, doing spanning tree and changing the priority to zero would help in changing the backup one here to 4096. Now, that doesn't stop somebody from maliciously coming in and uh, also changing their priority to zero. And if they've got a lower MAC address, they could win out and then they could still become the root. But the reality is, is that this network really should be a trusted network this is your network here okay if you own all this network it only should be you and your team touching this and if your team um are poorly trained or maybe just juniors on the job learning which is fine um it might be an idea to use something like tacax tacax plus whereby when they ssh in to a device to do some uh, remote configuration TACAX is set up that only certain commands are available to them. So when they log in under their username, things like changing spanning tree root priorities or root, uh, root priorities can't happen. So you protect it that way. These are better implementations, I think. Another thing to consider is, okay, well, what about just putting root uh, guard at the edge of the network down here? Well, you could do that. But the reality is, is that if a switch is going to be there, it should be... All of these access ports should really be configured with BPDU guard anyway. So if a switch is attached to the network unexpectedly, then it shouldn't even be participating in spanning tree at all, much less just try to protect it from influencing the root bridge election. Just don't let it don't let it um, influence spanning tree at all. BPDU guard blocks it right out. And I think these are better measures in light of the potential risks of implementing root guard. I don't think it particularly does the job that great at what it sets out to do. Now, one thing which I want to do highlight is what I do think it does do its job is a post by Peter Palak. I don't know if I'm saying the, his name correctly. He's a very well respected CCIE. He posts a lot on the Cisco form and his posts are always excellent to be honest with you. Um, and like I say, he says this, he likes to challenge us. I would highly recommend you read this. So pretty much Google root guard clarification and type in Peter Palio and you'll find this uh, post. And what he basically states is something that root guard shouldn't be really used inside your network and that's pretty much what I'm getting at. Your network is controlled in a trusted environment. That's pretty much what I'm saying. So let's say where would it actually be um, useful? Like I say, in the case of, this is not really a service provider network, but if this was a service provider network and you happen to be connecting out to a customer which are running layer two as well. So you've got a layer two connection. This is your network here. And this is the untrusted network over here from the customer. Okay, it's not like at your normal access layer where you can just put BPDU guard because you do want switches to be able to talk with BPDUs. Okay, you don't want to just BPDU guard it at the edge and just 
disallow if a switch attaches you're going to block the port that means your customer can't access uh, your network which you're trying to kind of share with each other the way and um, to implement that really is you're saying with root guard in this case you're saying i want layer two connections at this untrusted edge here to happen but i don't want these switches in here to be able to influence the root bridge election to me i think that's a much better use case of root guard so in the case of root guard like i say just to sum it up um it's supposed to be configured on designated ports that shouldn't be root ports the general consensus seems to be, at least from what I've read, to put it on a distribution layer. I'm trying to caution against that. Like I say, if you find a reason to do that, then by all means, go with your own instinct. This is just my personal opinion. If you think it's wrong, then that's your choice, obviously. Um, but what I want to highlight is that I do think its use case is when you're connecting to an untrusted network. If it's your guys running the network, your untrusted network, things like BPDU guard at the edge, Things like hard coding your priority to zero and your secondary one to 4096 and implement things like TACAC so junior admins can't actually inadvertently cause these mistakes whilst they're still learning. I think these are much better use cases of root guard. Um, but like I say, when it comes to the CCMP, you do need to know the implementation and you need to know um, how it works and why it does what it does. So that's pretty much the aim of this video. But without it again it getting too long, I'm going to chop it here and the next one I think is going to be on loop guard. So thanks very much uh, and I'll see you guys soon. Okay, bye bye.